Welcome to this panel. Uh, we're going to try to address the question today of what is history good for? A short, small question to deal with. And to help us with this question, we have uh, four historians. Some of them uh, have air aired in two different lands right now. They're in a sort of purgatory of administration. Well, actually, most of them are in purgatory right now. God help us. That's what history's good for, right? Yeah. No, actually, I'm going to argue it's not good for that. <laughs> but there will be four different takes on the topic. First of all, with uh, Dr. Steve Pointer, who is coming from uh, Trinity International University and who will be speaking on history and society. Then I will be speaking on history and the person. Then Dr. Joel Carpenter, who is coming from Calvin College, where he is the director of the Nagel Institute for the Study of World Christianity, will be speaking on history and the global church. And then uh, Dr. Shirley Mullen, who really aired because not only has she left history, but she's left Westmont College, <laughs> will be speaking on history and the liberal arts. So I kept those bios very short because you can find a lot more on the back of your programs if you have your programs with you because we want to hear what historians actually have to say today. So, Dr. Steve Pointer. Thank you, Marianne. Mm. So what is history good for? History and society is my designated topic. The early months of 2009 have already witnessed an unusually high visibility for history on the public awareness scale. The average person on the street, with or without media prompting or reinforcement, routinely could not help but describe the inauguration of Barack Obama as President of the United States without using the word historic to explain the events of January 20th. Less satisfying, but still likely to elicit the public reaction of historic, along with more pejorative descriptors, were the, unsavory <coughs> excuse me, were the unsavory events in Illinois politics involving the impeachment and removal from office of the standing governor, Rod Blagojevich. Add in the historical ongoing debacle of Roland Burris holding the U.S. Senate seat from Illinois, and you have an unlikely trio of Illinois politicians occupying the public spotlight, yet all three disparate characters prompting the language of history by people trying to make sense of such unusual occurrences. The bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth last month, yet another former Illinois politician in the news, also occasioned an outpouring of historically framed language to celebrate the event. What does all this suggest? Unless the people of Illinois are that different from the rest of American society, it reminds us that we have been taught to resort to history to recognize the extraordinary and to remember the memorable. And this is as it should be. History provides our nation with a frame of reference to discern the truly unique and to observe the notably significant. It elevates our consciousness and appreciation of the distinctive person, event, movement, Again, I think all of this is to the good of society. But what of the ordinary person, event, movement? What about the mundane affairs of daily life? Does history have any relevance for a society that blithely assumes, apart from the inbreaking of the extraordinary, that the past can safely be ignored? Those who assume that history can be ignored for it either lacks meaning or any meaning to be found is entirely relative to the beholder. Even more to the point, can't the study of history be relegated to those dinosaurs who enjoy antiquarian curiosities, while the rest of us cope with the tyranny of the urgent, be that wars, economic crises, or simply our individual pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness? Well, in a different place and time, C.S. Lewis made one of the most eloquent responses to this ever-pressing question. Speaking to Oxford students in the fall of 1939, just after World War II had begun, Lewis asked if the pursuit of any studies could be justified in such a time of national emergency. 
Is not such a dalliance, asked Lewis, akin to fiddling while Rome burned? His own answer not only valued the task of learning, even in wartime, but particularly emphasized the study of history. Said Lewis, and I quote, most of all, we need intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present to remind us that the basic assumptions have been quite different in different periods and that much which seems certain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be see to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. The scholar has lived in many times and therefore in some degree is immune from the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the press and the microphone of his own age." Unquote. That's taken from his address, Learning in Wartime. As Lewis suggests, history can be invaluable in alerting us to the transitory nature of some of the values and assumptions of our own age and culture. If we better understand what other persons and cultures have done, we can help dismantle the self-centered worlds we have made. Christians in particular should warm to the study of history with this purpose. For long ago, St. Augustine chastened Christians to be alert to their dual citizenship, encouraging us to discern our true home in the city of God and not conforming too comfortably to our particular earthly kingdom. Instead, always setting biblical values as the measuring rod for individual and social comparison. The study of history then, I think, functions as an antidote to our perpetual provincial tendencies of place and time. Still further, it functions as our collective memory. Just as an individual with amnesia is virtually paralyzed by the loss of memory, so also a society without a developed sense of its own past is also rendered helpless. Yet, fortunately for both individuals and society, our, our memories are remarkably selective. If any of us had an exhaustive recall of the past, we would also be incapacitated, incapable of sifting through the mountain of data to know what was truly important and where to find meaning in it all. Instead, as all students of history are acutely aware, making sense of the past is necessarily a selective task and an interpretive one. So what good then is history? Knowing our collective story enables us to recognize the new and to commemorate the significant. Still more, assessing the adequacy of that story, comparing it to other stories, and above all for Christians, setting it over against the biblical drama of creation, fall, and redemption will more realistically situate us in God's world, even in Illinois, uh -huh. especially in Illinois. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. What we're going to do here is save our questions for the panelists until the end of the panel, and we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes to do that at the end. Um, the road I've chosen to talk about the history and the person is the one that wonders around this question. How does the study of history shape the person, the amateur, the student, and the professional historian? What do we hope the study of history would do to a person? And I'll start with where we are at home, our feet well grounded in the soil. I'll start with the image of the historian as the tree flourishing in the garden. <laughs> 